Welcome to Outlet's Flight Deck, podcast dedicated to Montreal Outlet's football. I am Tim Capper. You can find me on Twitter at Repact. That's R E P P A C T. And I'm Cliffy D. You can also find me on Twitter at Cliffy D. And this episode of the Outlet's Flight Deck is presented by our good friends over at Sport Buff, where right now, if you use the promo code Flight Deck 10, you will save 10% off your entire order. Head on over to www.sportbuttshop.com for all of your sportsing needs. And don't forget, we are on the internet, many, many places. But if you head over to alouettesflightdeck.ca, you can check out our entire archive of our seven years that we've been broadcasting. Or well, six plus, six plus, we're in our seventh year now. Uh, you can head over to Twitter, that's at alouettesfldeck. Instagram is instagram.com slash alouettesflightdeck. Facebook Search for Alouette's Flight Deck Pod. Our merchandise can also be found over at teespring.com slash stores slash Owl's Flight Deck. And finally, you can also find us on YouTube. Uh, that is youtube.com slash Alouette's Flight Deck. And as a reminder, we will be giving away the, uh, we will be finding out who is going to be the winner of the Delta Logo Satin Jacket. And again, that will be done before the end of our broadcast season. Well, Tim, we're doing something a little bit, a little bit different and a little bit special this week. Uh, in addition to our regular show, uh, we're doing a bonus episode to kind of go over something that we did on last week's episode of the Flight Deck. Uh, we talked about the history of this being the 25th anniversary of the infamous Eastern semifinal game between the Alouettes and the BC Lions, which is typically known as the U2 game. And for those who don't have an, a damn idea what we're talking about. <laughs> why don't you give them a, just a little bit of a history as to why we referred to this game as the U2 game? Well, to give a, a quick synopsis is that uh, in uh, because of the way the Alouettes finished in 97 and because of the playoffs, uh, they were going to be hosting uh, the Eastern semifinal. But because U2 had booked the, uh, the Olympic Stadium at that time, they needed to find another location to play the game. And needless to say, the rest is history. We don't want to give away too much. So we just had to give the quickest, you know, qu- quickest tidbit <laughs> as we could. Right, Cliff? Because we do have a, a very special guest uh, to talk to us about just the goings on for 90 leading up to the 1997 game, which is also, you know, the infamous U2 game. So we're very happy to have Mark Waitman on the show with us. But let me ask you a a quick question here, Cliff, before we get to the interview. And this is before you and I knew each other. Mm -hmm. What do you, and obviously this past week, as I I think mentioned last week, I also went back and rewatched the game from 97 on YouTube. We didn't know each other 25 years ago, but again, we were in the stands also at the same time. What do you remember most from that game? I just remember, like, it's actually kind of funny because I actually had uh, media access (laughs) to Olympic Stadium as a member of, like I was writing for my Seychelles newspaper and I managed, as a sports editor, I managed to finagle myself a, uh, a press pass for the entire season, which I thought was pretty awesome. Wow, uh, that's cool. So, so I had been following the team as, and covering them, so to speak, as much as I could uh, with my media credentials. Uh, but for this game, I when they announced that they were going to be moving the game to uh, Molson Stadium, I'm like, oh crap. I got to go. And I I had a feeling, too, that, uh, okay, Canadian college kid, uh, you know, you, you want to sit in the press box? Get the F out of here. That's not happening. <laughs> so, I, I okay, I'm going to have to, you know, I'm actually going to have to pay for a ticket this time around. So, I, I, I you know, uh, with my girlfriend at the time, we decided, uh, yeah, we got to go to this game. And I don't I didn't care where I was going to sit. I'm like, okay, outdoor football? Hell yeah, I want to be a part of that. And also to the fact that the Alouettes were – an extremely competitive team, uh, fighting tooth and nail. Uh, you know, they, they they had it going on. I mean, you had like uh, Mike Pringle setting all kinds of records. He was just a beast of a running back. Like you, you, you kids out there, you see William Stanback, what he's doing. Times that by ten. That was Mike Pringle in a nutshell. I mean, he was just an outstanding football player. So I knew I wanted to be at this game. I wanted to see live football outdoors, no less. I mean, in November, I'm like. Hell yeah, I don't care. I don't care how cold it was. Let it snow, let it rain. I don't care. I want to see live football, open air style. And yeah, we we went to the game and it was just a blast. I mean, it, it really did feel at times that it felt like they were kind of making things up as they go along. Like when it came to like the actual production of the game itself, 
Uh, I mean, the on-field product was more than fine. There was no question about that. Uh, But as far as getting people into the stands and everything, I I just remember it just really felt like they were kind of winging it as best they could. And it worked. That was the funny thing was it worked. And being surrounded by people just having such a good time, people were really enjoying themselves. They were loud. They were boisterous. They were – it, it was a football crowd, like what mm-hmm. we come to have come to expect now at personal most statement, and sometimes I think even take for granted at times. I mean, this this was it. Like this was a crowd that was one hundred percent dialed in and focused on having a good time. And at that point, like, okay, well, we can't go back. We can't go back to the Big O. It's cavernous. It's you know, it's so drab. It's yeah, it's not I, fun. I hated like, the Big O. I hated the Big O. I hated where my, you know, even in the times when we would had we would have to go back to the Big O for a playoff game. I, it was just because it took me out of my element. And, you know, they changed where my seats were located and stuff like that. And, you know, I think what's pretty funny, Cliff, is, you know, we currently are sit, we are currently sitting in Section Y1. 25 years ago, my seats were in Section Y. I think that's, <laughs> to me, that's phenomenal. It's just, it's just. <laughs> To this day, I mean, yes, I've changed locations. I was originally in Section Z, but still, to currently be, you know, me to be in Section Y then, to be in Y1 now, you know, I, it, with all honesty, 25 years ago, uh, I, I don't rem- I don't remember that. There's just, just a few things that pop into my head. I think it's just the idea of being in a, at an outdoor game, a, a complete change, uh, something brand new for me. Um, you know, I'd see many games indoors, whether it had been, you know, an arena, arena game or, or, or stuff like that. But this was, you know, this, you know, and what we know now about what, you know, for this game to be a success from what we know now, you know, we could have seen the very last game in Alouette's history, but that, you know, that, that's, that's a little bit more for Mark to talk about when we get to his first interview. Yeah, no, I just remember just being there. In that crowd at that moment, I mean, I there's so many things I don't remember about the game itself, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I, I definitely remember just the atmosphere being second to none, and the fact that it was yeah, 100. It, it it was thrown together last minute and it worked, and you know what? That's sometimes that's sometimes the Montreal way. You like you're sitting there going, "What the hell? What 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 kind of nonsense is this?" And then just somehow it works, and you're like, "This is awesome! I can't believe it worked, but it works." And I mean, ever since then. Like the rest, as they say, is history because look what this team was able to do since then. Like, since being able to go back to Percival Molson Stadium, you know, for all of their games, uh, with the exception, as you said, there's a couple of times, a couple of playoff games were played at the Olympic Stadium, and that's where you get the crowds of like 40, 50,000. And that's always amazing if you can pull it off. Yeah. But to me, like, that really was what fostered that culture of football in Montreal and what made Percival Molson the place to be. And I, I still say it, like, I've been to, nearly every CFL stadium in this league and for my money, like, and call me a homer if you want, but I really do feel like there is no place like home when it comes to an absolutely electric atmosphere. When you give this crowd something to cheer about, Mm -hmm. and I've said this a million times and I'll say it again, you give this crowd something to cheer about. And yeah, it's only 20,000 sometimes at the most, but man, it gets loud. It gets crazy. And it is just such a fun atmosphere. Like it's just absolutely amazing place to watch a football game. Yep. And I've brought people to personal Molson and th- th- whenever they've been in that crowd, when the crowd is just so jacked and so hyped, people walk away saying, Holy cow, that was, that was amazing. That is a great place to watch a football game. Exactly. So from, from the game, from the game in 97, you know, from the game in 97, what led after it, uh, through two changes uh, of, of, uh, artificial turf or, 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 or what I know, you know, art, whatever they call it, synthet- synthetic turf now, uh, to, you know, uh, to the, uh, uh, new stands at the stadium, to the expansion, we get into that and a little bit more with Mark, uh, during our interview. So without further ado, let's, let's go back in time a little bit and let's talk to Mark Waitman about how he was involved with the Alouettes and that infamous 1997 U2 game. Well, this past week, the, the Alouettes, uh, obviously with their win over the uh, over the Hamilton Tiger Cats, they actually celebrated the 25th anniversary of the infamous U2 game. Uh, that is where the Alouettes had to be uh, moved from Olympic Stadium and find another place to play because of U2 playing at the Big O during their Pop Mart tour. Uh, what I felt to go over history for the Owls, it would be... What better way is to speak with a gentleman who was involved with the 
a little bit of the process itself and was with the team at that time. I'm sure you'll remember him, former president and CEO of the Montreal Alouettes, Mark Waitman. Hey, Mark, thanks for joining us. Hey, Tim. Hey, Cliff. Great to, great to speak with you today, and uh, thanks for having me on. Um, for, first and foremost, I mean, I'm just going to get to the, the question that I've been asking a lot of people as of late, Mark. I mean, in your opinion, I, I know you were with the team, uh, you know, up until 2016. You started with its team in 96. Do you think moving to the Molson Stadium uh, saved the franchise? Because a lot of people, you know, who just really just started looking, following the team as of late may have not known the full story behind what happened to the early days of the Alouettes when they returned. But is it fair to say that we can thank you, too, for being able to still watch the, the Alouettes at Percival Molson today? Without a shadow of a doubt. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that um, the move to Molson Stadium and the, the renewed energy and excitement about you know, having that environment of a real football stadium uh, up close to the action um, you know, and with the history of that stadium and all, even if those that first year, especially that first game, um, there was probably more focus on the duct tape and and, and and plywood that was put to sort of block some holes here and there just to make the stadium work for that game. Um, but the excitement that was generated from that game um, sort of catapulted the the Alouettes into its next generation and 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 most definitely allowed. The team to survive and gave gave uh, gave Mr. Wettenhall at the time the a, a reason to believe that this this franchise could really survive and strive in in, uh, in Montreal. Um, I'm sure one people think will people remember also because I came across it while doing some research. Mark is that infamous tree, <laughs> the tree that was smack dab in the middle of the uh, of the of the stadium stands over on the north side. Yep, I'm actually looking at a picture of that old stadium right now here in my office. Um, I still have a picture of the uh, 1997 um, Olsen Stadium and where the hole is in the stands where that tree was growing. Um, it was one of the first things we had to do when we went down there. Um, you know, as, as you know, as you know we, we, it definitely wasn't planned to play at that, that stadium. Um, you know, to, for, for those that may not recall, I mean, we, we were in our second season at uh, at the Big O, uh, second season back in Montreal, and it was a bit of a tough season uh, in the stands on the field. Things things were going very well um, after a I think we were 500 after five or six games, but then kind of took off. And um, uh, but a tough season, and you know when it comes to crowds and, and general excitement around the team. Um, and the Olympic Stadium had booked, as you mentioned, U2 for a concert. Um, and when we ended up qualifying for a home playoff game, uh, we earned it by finishing in second place. And it became quite apparent about a month before the end of the season that that was going to be the outcome, the most likely outcome. So then we started looking at, we're talking to the stadium saying, okay, well, how do we do this for the game? And it became apparent to everyone that logistically it was an impossibility to host the game at the big O. I believe the concert was on the f- Saturday and so our game was to be on the Sunday, November 2nd. And so obviously a major concert like that, you know, takes a lot of time. Take it down after and then, you know, we had to put in the field and that took a few days in itself to get a game, uh, get a game ready. So we looked at, can we play the game earlier? Can we play the game a few days later? That, of course, was an impossibility. And so we were given an ultimatum from the league saying, find another place in Montreal to play that game or you give up your home game and you will go play away. So in this case, we would have had to go to BC and play Lions out in Vancouver. Um, and clearly that I think would have been the final nail in the coffin, you know, as far as the fans that were hanging on and, and were supporting us <clears throat> through thick and thin, it would have been a bit of a slap in the face to say, Oh, by the way, now we're going to go play this home playoff game on the road. And so we had to find another place that could hold, you know, 15, 20,000 people and, that could host a game. And it was literally four weeks before the game was being held. This is early October. Um, and uh, after doing a little bit of research, it became quite apparent that, you know, the only venue that came close was McGill. Um, so uh, Larry Smith and myself, I mean, there was a few meetings going on back and forth here, but at one point, Larry Smith and myself went down to meet with the folks from McGill Athletics and went and had a look around the stadium to kind of see what's this, 
state of the of the of the you know the stands and and, and the other facilities. And uh, I still remember actually opening up a door. Uh, the the McGill staff opened up a door on the north side to one of the washrooms. So we wanted to see the state of the washrooms. And, and clearly this door hadn't been opened since the last time it was used for a major event, which probably was the lacrosse events or field hockey for the Olympics in 76, because this door was quite bad shape. And we opened it up. And as we opened up the door and out ran a raccoon and kind of ran and scurried through the, 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 the group of us. <laughs> and it kind of just tells you everything you need to know about the condition of the, the north side of the stands. Uh, you said it. There was a tree, uh, probably about five, six inches in diameter, going right up through the staircase between section. Uh, you're really going to test my memory. I think L and M, <laughs> uh, L1 and L, M1. Um, and um, we, we spent several hours going through every room and trying to figure out, okay, well, we could use this room for the officials. We could use that room for the media, but we'd have to add some space here. And just trying to figure out, uh, really, a, it was like a big jigsaw puzzle, but, you know, many of the pieces were missing. And um, at the end of the visit, uh, we went back to the office, and I, I still remember Larry clearly asking me. We, it, I, it was three and a half weeks before the day the game needed to be played. And I still remember Larry asking me, so you think we can make this work? And every fiber in my being was telling me, no, no way. And there's no way we can, you know, fix that place up to host fans and, 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 a, and, a, and a playoff game. But of course I said, sure we can. And um, <laughs> we, uh, we all kind of jumped into it and, and said, let's, let's just figure it out. And I don't think any of the, any of us slept um, for the next three and a half weeks, it was just a mad scramble to find a way uh, to to uh, to make this venue first of all safe. Um, you know, we had to get engineers to come in and, and verify that the structure was sound enough to support the fans, and then we had condemned sections and we had to tear down the fences that were you know blocking it off. And then we had a contractor come in; he was fantastic um, uh, to 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 just plug holes and, and, you know, make it so that nobody would fall through anything and, and you could have people sitting. And uh, we had to figure out a makeshift way to number the seats because, you know, you can imagine there was not even any benches, let alone numbers mm -hmm. on the seats. Uh, we had to figure out a manifest of the arena so we could find a way to sell the tickets and have people know where to go. We built a temporary press box out of two by fours and plywood and just threw on a coat of paint that I'm pretty sure we finished up the morning of the game. Um, just threw everything together. I, I remember getting a, uh, people on our events team. We rented a Q van and we went over to, to, to our own, but they were great. They lent us a bunch of these big, you know, mobile, even though they weighed a ton, these big mobile turnstiles. And we brought them down to Molson Stadium to, to set them up. So we'd have some form of ticket control at the entrances. Um, we got some people to come in that could operate food and beverage for us so we could sell some beer and hot dogs. Um, it was just a mad scramble. Um, and that day when the game finally happened, I think we just, I, I just, we were all standing around with our fingers crossed thinking, okay, let's, let's hope this works. And, um, it became, it was a magical day. It was, um, I think beyond anything we ever could have hoped for. Um, it was really scary at first because we knew we had, we'd sold a fair number of tickets, but there was a lot being sold the day of and, but the first quarter, the stands were still half empty. And we're like, oh my goodness, what's, you know, what happened? But then we just realized after the fact, it was just people had forgotten how to get to Molson Stadium and let alone how to park there. I mean, that's still a challenge today sometimes, but at least most people have figured it out over the years. And so by the end of the first quarter, all of a sudden, then it really started filling up. And then by the second quarter, and then we really had a nice vibe going in the building. And, um, you know, we, uh, I remember we came out to a pretty good start. I remember it was so symbolic. Um, Mike Souls, um, McGill football all-star. Um, first touchdown scored by the Owls that day was Mike Souls. And that was just so fitting. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I remember the team just firing on all cylinders. It was a pretty high-scoring game, if I remember, 45-35, if I'm not mistaken. 
Uh, Pringle ran for, you might have to correct me here, but it, I has 265 or 268 in my head for some reason. So I remember, I remember Mike saying in an interview after the game, he says, this place is fantastic. And if they could just put down natural grass, this, this, this place would be great. Um, we didn't put down natural grass and we didn't put down proper astroturf until, or, or field turf for another few years, but he did run for 2000 yards on that same field the next year. So clearly Mike liked, <laughs> liked that field. <laughs> And it was a magical day. It was, uh, it was, um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the article, I think it was in the Gazette the next day or the next week, the headline was um, sporting event of the decade um, or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And that was the headline of, of the um, report on the game the next day. Um, and that was a pretty big statement in the same decade that the Habs had won the Stanley Cup in 93. I was going to say. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> So it was a pretty, it was a pretty big statement. And so, uh, and I think that's just, and then, you know, from that point on, you know, the, the rest is history. As they say, we, we found a home and people were passionate about not only the team, it was a very good team. It was from the first day we moved back to Montreal, but also had a really you know, fun environment um, to watch a football game. In, and that's most of the thing. Um, I know that uh, the, from, for those who are wondering out there, um, it was first announced on September 20th in the Gazette, and the, the title of the story was YouTube Bumps Owls from Olympic Stadium. Now, people need to remember that the Owls had not played at this stadium. Uh, sorry, f- pro football had been played at the stadium since 1967, and before the Alouettes moved to the Autostad, um, then the, and then to the Big O. Um, didn't, Mark, didn't you also ha- go through some other real big issues too because you know McGill at that time was looking to destroy the north side stands if I'm not mistaken and, and didn't you have to uh, you know basically I guess either talk them out of it or also because you're, you're also having to deal with uh, the friends of the mountain which today even today we're dealing with you know because obviously what they want to preserve the sight lines but there were some other obstacles you had to go through too just just besides trying to get the stadium up to snuff for the game. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, now that, that of course was more of a challenge that we had going forward after that one game, that one off was, you know, and it, like I said, it was duct tape and band-aids that held the place together so that we could just host that first game. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, what happened after that is, uh, you know, Mr. Wettenhall was kind of intrigued by, okay, well, could this work? at McGill moving forward and a lot of season ticket holders sent in their money for their season ticket renewal with a note saying only if at McGill. And we had several hundred that, that, that conveyed that message to us saying that they wanted to move forward with the team, but only at McGill. So we basically had the mandate to work out, you know, an agreement with the McGill university to have a, a more long-term lease. Mm-hmm. And one of the, one of the first, um, Challenges was what you just said is that McGill um, over the years had made uh, an agreement with the city and, and, and primarily through the lobbying of the Friends of the Mountain. Now, uh, the Friends of the Mountain want to preserve the, the view of the mountain and the, the, the natural environment uh, and, uh, you know, all, all those good things that, that make Mount Royal and the parks surrounding Mount Royal as special as it is. And, and uh, you know, as much as sometimes for those of us that just want to go in there and build a build football stadium, build a big football stadium, might find it to be a bit of a pain in the butt. Um, you know, what they do is, is is a big part of why Mount Royal is as special as it is. But in this particular case, there is a pre-existing agreement. I believe it may have been a bit of a trade-off that McGill had made with them when they wanted to either. I'm not sure if it was to. Um, you know, either expand the arena or, or, or something to do with the hospital or the MNI. But I know there'd been some form of trade-off where it was like, okay, well, they agreed that they would demolish the, the upper section of the North stand. So, you know, there's the, there's the, um, there's the two, two levels of stands on the North side, as you know, below the press box. Mm-hmm. And so the, the elevated part above the, what is a parking lot every other day of the year underneath the North concourse was um, slated to be demolished um, within a year or two. And so obviously that would have cut significantly into the number of seats that the stadium had, which was already very small, even by, you know, CFL standards was very, very small. Um, so we had to um, come to an agreement with, uh, with the city as to, 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 you know, agree to uh, 
not uh, or to break that agreement, I guess is the best way to put it. Right. And, uh, so there was again, there was some trading off going going on there. And and as we looked forward into the expansion of the stadium, or which we did in two phases, there was the 2003 or, or three and four because it's been over two years, and then again in 2010 um, or nine and ten. Phase one was supposed to be an expansion, but ended up being more of a reconstruction of what was there. There was very little added. And then in 2009, 2010 was the expansion. Um, but again, to get the permits to, to do those projects, there was a long, long list of things that needed to be done um, to, to meet the different requirements from the city and, and, and the Friends of the Mountain. And especially in the 2009, 2010, we had to show that you wouldn't be able to see any of the stands from the outside. We had to plant a lot of trees to replace those that were being taken down. We had to do a lot of cosmetic work to 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 allow the the look of the stadium to integrate itself well into its environment, which is a uh, primarily you know green uh, natural environment uh, on on that side of the mountain. Wow, um, I, I do remember reading this, and I, I they, so the they. The Owls drew 16,257 for that game. There was a story a little bit a couple of months later uh, where it was stated that uh, Mr. Wetnall said that they, they, they actually ran out of tickets. They actually were left 1,500 people waiting. So there's the possibility that you could have reached capacity. Is, do you remember that, that, that happening where you had to actually turn, back, turn away people from the game? Yeah, and you know what? I'm not even sure so much if we turn people away or if they ended up just finding a way to sneak in because it was it was sort of <laughs> organized confusion that day. You yeah. know, there was so much going on in the, in a venue that had never served for a major event or hadn't in, in many in several decades. Um, so everything from the ticketing system, which wasn't what it is today, right? In 1997, you couldn't just go on your iPhone and and, and order your tickets on, on Ticketmaster. Mm-hmm. There, we were a little bit more archaic in our ways back then. And so, uh, you know, the lineups, the systems uh, were not what they are today. It caused a lot of delay. Um, you know, I think people were trying to call in before and we, and, and the, the, the ticketing op- ticket operators weren't able to meet the demand. So, uh, so yeah, I think we, we felt that we, we definitely left, um, you know, left a few people um, hanging there, so to speak, as far as uh, being able to buy tickets. And there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, if, if we would have been a little bit, you know, if the ticketing operations would have been a little tighter that day, we probably could have sold that out and, and, and done some. For sure. Um, when it comes to Mr. Wet, and obviously I read some things where I think the initially to, it was around fifty thousand dollars. I think it, I think I read where to uh, do the initial work to clean up the stadium in, in order to get the get the stadium ready for that for the game that uh, for the for that game day, um, and then the Owls making a an agreement with the with the university itself to, you know, every year with your your initial year contracts to rent the stadium, you'd put an X amount of money into the stadium each year. Um, how at first, how open was Mr. Wetnall to just? You know, I, I saw that he did like the idea, and and you've mentioned that too. It, it, he seemed to be a gentleman that just wanted to make sure that this thing succeeded as much as possible. Yeah, there's no doubt that that Mr. Wettenhall's love for for the team, for football, and for the city, because um, um, most people know that Mr. Wettenhall is an American uh, uh, by birth and, and um, well, spent most of his life in the U.S., but um, he spent almost all of his time up here once he became uh, owner of the Alouettes and and, uh, and cared a lot about the, the city and, 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 and our fans. Uh, but, you know, yes, at those initial stages, um, I believe that 50,000 that was announced very quickly became 75, mm. uh, even for that first game. And um, uh, every year, you, you said it exactly right, in addition to rent, um, there were upgrades that were needed that we would identify um, that would get done, that we would sort of manage those projects along with McGill, but um, were financed by Mr. Wettenhall. And that was basically putting, it's like putting money in to renovate your neighbor's house. You know, it's not yours. You're not going to walk away with it. Um, it did allow us to, you know, benefit from better, from a better venue and provide a better fan experience for our fans, which in turn helped us 
um, you know, do uh, help us with our business and selling tickets. And uh, I was going to say suites, but back in those days, they were easy up pop up tents that were mm-hmm. at the top of the stands on the north side. Um, but uh, but yeah, clearly, I don't not a, I don't know a lot of people that would agree to take their money and, and invest in, in their neighbor's house, so to speak. Um, uh, but uh, he he did it. Uh, uh, you know, he, he, he stepped up every time. He, he believed in the project. He believed that the Owls could be um, uh, not only a success story on the field, but, a, a, you know, a viable business long term. Um, and, and at that time, clearly, it was, it was playing in that stadium. So uh, we, we spent every dollar very, very diligently. We, uh, we got very creative in the ways that we um, would spend that money and, 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 and add to the um, – or to the improvements uh, to the stadium, uh, we had to. Uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. We 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 know that uh, that that served us well, and um, uh, leading right up until that first major renovation, which was about fourteen million dollars in two thousand three. Yeah, and you know, I I know how long you you worked with the team, and I mean, you started off in early of ninety six. Um, it's hard to, to fathom that you yourself, you basically lived th- through the potential death of the team twice, you know, with 96 and then Jim Spiros and Michael Gelfin being in there. And, and, and anybody who know who was a season ticket back then knows exactly how season ticket holders were treated. And, but then luckily with, uh, you know, with Mr. Wetnall coming in and, and saving the team and, you, you had one hell of an experience as, you know, being with the team just in your first two or three years. No, absolutely, and uh, I mean, uh, we can even go back a year further because I my CFL start, my Elwood start obviously was '96, but my CFL start was with the Stallions in Baltimore in '95, mm. and and that was that was a great experience, but that also ended in a season where the team was left without a home because the Browns were moving to Baltimore mm-hmm. and becoming the Ravens, and so it was kind of that was also sort of a another death of the franchise in the sense that despite things that were things going so well with, you know, 35,000 average attendance, if I'm not mistaken and, and, and whatnot. Um, so, so yeah, so 96 was kind of, you know, another roller coaster ride and, and, uh, and then uh, even going into 97 and not knowing well what's going to happen. So, you know, when you look back over these last 25, 26, you know, in my case, 27 years, um, that was really the turning point, and uh, uh, and and thank goodness we had uh, Robert Wettenhall to uh, to uh, to help us through it all because uh, I, I still I, I know fans know a lot of the things that he did, but there's a lot of things that he did that people don't know, and and and, and he just did behind the scenes. And if it wasn't for Bob, you know, just, this club wouldn't be here today. Yeah, are you uh, are you the one responsible for starting the tradition of playing U two before the kickoff on the sa- on the on the Saturday uh, the Sunday games? <laughs> You've got good sources. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I felt that playing uh, Sunday, Bloody Sunday, right before kickoff on a Sunday game at Boston Stadium um, was just, uh, you know, just felt right, uh, especially after uh, what they did for us to, without knowing it, but uh, what they did to allow us to survive. Yeah, I was going to say, did you ever think about sending you to a fruit basket or something as a kind of a thank you as well, <laughs> or you figured just playing the music was enough? <laughs> Um, I figured that the, as, as a tribute, uh, they probably appreciate uh, knowing that we were playing their songs. We did evolve after a little while, or on games that weren't on Sundays where we play Beautiful Day or something. But uh, uh, I don't remember exactly how, but I do remember hearing some at one point, like several years later, where they were made aware of this and, and that they were uh, appreciative of the fact that we always had a sort of symbolic wink to, uh, to their band uh, uh, as a thank you for for our franchise still being around. Yeah. And I will admit, uh, I know you said it earlier, but uh, it, it was actually that day for sports and music fans, it was for that November 2nd, 1997, Mark, it, it was actually a double header. It was the game and then the concert the same day. So it was, oh, one, that's right. Yeah. It was one hell of a day for, uh, for sports, for, uh, for God, for people in, in Montreal, period. You're right. And now that you say that, I remember because um, our, our football ops guys, and even a lot of our staff, our office was still at the Big O. And so we had to return to the Big O to try to bring, you know, football equipment back and get guys ready for what turned out to be, you know, meetings and practices the next day to get ready for the Eastern final the next week in Toronto. And, um, 
Uh, and we, we, we had all the trouble in the world getting into the big O because there was a concert going on. You're right. Mm. I'd forgotten that part. <laughs> yeah. Cliff, anything? Uh, I got to know. What happened to the tree that was growing in the stadium? Did you guys relocate it and repurpose it, or was it just cut up and thrown out in the garbage? It, it, it was. Uh, it wasn't a very pretty tree, and it was even by tree experts uh, considered a weed. Um, <laughs> it wasn't uh, like a beautiful, uh, you know, birch or maple. That was. Uh, so we, uh, we we did bow our heads and 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 and, and say a few words. Uh, <laughs> Before we uh, before we chopped it down, and then okay, you, and, then, and then you made sure to count how many rings were inside yeah, the trunk itself. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, I obviously, I mean, it's been such a, a long time since we've spoken with you, uh, Mark. I mean, we really appreciate your time. I would love hearing the story about you know uh, this is part of Montreal Alouette's history, and you know once we were coming upon the 25th anniversary of the game itself. Um, I made sure that I was at practice that day, uh, that last Wednesday, on field because it it was it was you know to me it, it was very significant and it was a, a the the day to be there and to pay homage, not only to the band but also what they created today. So um, when you look back at that very hectic time, Mark, what what are you gonna what can you remember the most? <laughs> um, I think just a sense of a uh, sense of pride and accomplishment. Um, for our entire organization at the end of that day and just sort of standing in the middle of the field once it was all over and kind of pinching ourselves thinking like, okay, that really happened. And, and, and I think we knew that it was really special and it was going to, because up until that day, I mean, a lot of us kind of felt like this, this is not just the first game at Molson State in a long time, but this might be the last game in Montreal again, mm-hmm. um, you know, after 87. And now we, we, we really didn't feel optimistic that the Owls were going to be back in 98. And uh, I think we knew at the end of that game that something had changed. And so that what I remember is, you know, standing there with, with our whole team, uh, you know, our staff at the time, uh, after, you know, that day, just kind of having that feeling of accomplishment and, and feeling of hope, I guess, that uh, there's, there's, more, there's going to be more football played at Molson Stadium. Yeah. Luckily, we were, we were right. Exactly. Cliff, any, any last uh, questions for Mark? Oh, man, listen, this has been such a treat. Uh, Mark, thank you once again for kind of taking us down memory lane a little bit and uh, just letting people know just, you know, it wasn't just a matter of if you build it, they will come. It was a matter of, oh, God, I hope they come because it was just, <laughs> it, it was a potential recipe for disaster. But like you said, on a wing and a prayer, you guys made it work and it turned out to be truly the turning point of this franchise because if this game didn't go down the way that it did, not just on the field with the Alouettes winning, but also with how everything went off, I won't say without a hitch because I'm sure there might have been a few hiccups here and there, but I mean, everything went well for the most part. And that pretty much, as you've mentioned a number, number of times now, that this is what basically restarted the franchise. No, that's right. And, and I, I must say, uh, you know, Tim, thanks for reaching out to me uh, uh, last week uh, on that day. I, I, it didn't occur to me. Um, I was actually away in Europe, and when I saw your message saying it was the 25th anniversary, uh, I think it was that day, or it was the day that I read the message anyways, um, I kind of I felt guilty for not remembering myself just because I'd been distracted with other things, but I couldn't believe it. It was 25 years that has passed since, since that day. Um, so, so thanks for um, bringing that up to me and making me Give me the opportunity to, 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 to think about it a little bit and recognize that, that milestone. And, uh, and thank you both for having me on. It's, it, you know, it's always fun talking football and talking Alouettes and especially, uh, you know, personal most of the same kind of felt like my second home for many, many years, having spent, you know, Lord knows how many hours in that place, uh, either organizing games or, or going through uh, renovation or expansion projects. And uh, um, so I appreciate uh, getting a chance to chat with you guys and, and also uh, to thank you guys for what you guys do with the, with the podcast. Uh, you know, it's been many years now. Is, it, is this your seventh year? Yep, it's our seventh broadcast season. Yep. Yeah, seventh season, uh, you know, and, and uh, you guys, you know, you guys do a lot for, for helping to build that Alouette's football tradition and, 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 and you know, creating that link with the fandom. And, and, and uh, it makes it that much more special when you get a year like like this year where you see that uh, I think Danny's got the team uh, got the team uh, really on track and uh, Noel's doing a great job with the defense and uh, that, that victory last weekend was really sweet and uh, I'm sure you guys 
as I am, looking, or are all looking forward to this Sunday and hopefully head down to Toronto and uh, and uh, give them a good uh, kick into the Argos. Exactly. And, um, you know, uh, again, much thanks uh, to you, Mark. Hopefully we can have you on again so you can reminisce more about uh, your your wow your many many years twenty one years uh, with the with the Montreal Alouettes and I you know without before we go I, I at least have to mention uh, if if anybody uh, who happens to recognize Mark's name well it's because he's currently the president and CEO of the Alliance de Trois-Rivières and he's also a, one of the governors for the Alliance de Montreal so if you see him say hello um, he, I know he's on social media but I mean you can just say hello to him and and. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure Mark will be uh, happy to talk uh, Alouettes football with with him. I'm sure. I, I'm speaking for you, Mark, but I'm sure that's that's right, right? Uh, <laughs> no, absolutely. Always, always, always fun to talk with the fans and talk about uh, talk about talk football and especially talk about the Owls. And, and uh, as now would have it, uh, I'm able to pick up a conversation when we talk about hockey or basketball too. So uh, uh, take your pick. Always fun to, t- to chat with the fans and uh, definitely fun to reminisce about all this stuff with you guys. If anybody wants to bookmark this as a as a historical lesson for Montreal football and why we have the Alouettes today, this is the episode and this is the interview that I think people need to uh, need to bookmark in their browser or in their their favorite episodes that they listen to, uh, uh, you know, via podcast or via YouTube. Yeah, it, it, it's incredible to think. I mean, twenty five years is a long time. I mean, there's probably a lot of listeners to the show that weren't even born uh, when when this game took place and maybe don't realize quite just how historical this was. Like just if this game doesn't happen and it gets pulled off the way that it did, this podcast probably wouldn't be happening. Like mm-hmm. this football team wouldn't be around or it'd be somewhere else possibly. I mean, it, it's it's so hard to say. I, I mean, like, really, truly this game and, and the, the, the decision to go back to Percival Molson Stadium full time that really is what saved this franchise, along with the ownership of Robert Wettenhall. Oh, yeah, for sure. God, God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for, for all that coming to place, this wouldn't be happening. None of this, I don't think, would be happening right now. So, I mean, it, it really does speak to just how tenuous things were back then and just being able to come out of it. Like coming out of it from, on the other side and seeing what this team was able to pull off in the 2000s and even into the 2010s is is tremendous. And it really, truly all did start when it came down to, oh, U2 is playing a concert at Olympic Stadium. We're supposed to play a football game at Olympic Stadium. Something's got to give, and it sure as hell ain't going to be U2. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. You can almost only wonder, Cliff, if, if it had gone down the way that it did this year in, in, in 2022, where it was literally a three week span before they had before they found out basically that they were going to host the Eastern semifinal. You can only imagine what it would have been like for us now to go through this type of thing. I am and, it, it it's just mind boggling. Yeah. And when I just think about the fact that in that time, like just the mad rush it must have been like to get Percival Molson Stadium, which was just looking like you know just decrepit looking and just mm-hmm. like you couldn't even believe like you, you took a look at the initial photos and like there is no way they're going to be able to play a football game here like a professional football game with like 20,000 plus fans in the stands not a chance in hell like and and to make it work and make sure that nothing crashes on anyone like make sure like nothing crumbles yeah. underneath yeah I, I mean just to hear Mark talk about the the work that was put into and like literally even up to the day of I know. like last minute stuff to be done and you're just like I said, with duct tape and band aids, uh, winging a prayer, whatever cliche you want to use, like <laughs> they, they, by the balls of their ass, they pulled it off, and God bless them for it because wow, I and, mean, just and, and I want it's incredible. I want to know how how un, uh, how is it that a raccoon is not the unofficial mascot of the Montreal Alouettes? You know, would would have been like inappropriate if you know the tree that was uh, as as uh, Mark said was unceremoniously chopped up and thrown mm-hmm. away mm-hmm. what if we called it the joshua tree <laughs> yeah. i'm just saying like you want to talk about a mascot i mean a raccoon is cool but i mean considering the tie-in with you two and if they could that not have been the joshua tree uh, very you know what very possible very possible <laughs> Uh, again, we want to thank Mark for, for bringing us down memory lane, and we hope that you learned a lot. Even if you had been at the game, there's a lot of information that may, that was not in the newspapers when I was doing my my historical research. So um, we're glad you were here. 
And obviously, we're hoping that you will be back for our next episode of the Alouette's Flight Deck. So for everybody here at the Alouette's Flight Deck, for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. Ron, final approach.